。接下来要嗯、呃、进行的是高中组的比赛。Okay, uh, now let's move on to the final of the、uh, senior division of this、uh, China to the World Speech Competition. We will first introduce、um, every judge and then welcome the first contestant. 参与高中组决赛的评审嘉宾，第一位是著名作家、最有影响力的 TED Speech 之一《The Power of Introverts》的演讲者 Mrs. Susan Kan。第二位是全美演讲与辩论联盟中国办公室学术总监 Mr. k e l Halley。第三位是全美演讲与辩论联盟国际项目总监 Mr. Stephen Bouchard。第四位是南京大学外语部副教授。朱氏朱教授，第五位是维师学院运营总监卢宪伟先生。跟初中组一样的是，我们一共也有十位同学进入了高中组的比赛。请所有选手注意，在正式开始你们的演讲之前，请将你们的选手编号。姓名和演讲主题告知裁判。For all the contestants, before presenting your speech, please state your contestant code, your name, and your origin title. So, for the judges, is everyone ready? Please type one in the chat box if you're ready. Perfect. So let's welcome the first contestant, Wang Peiyao from Brooks School. Hello. If you can hear me. Yes. Hi, Peiyao. Hi. Um. So, um. Can I start? <laughs> yes. Um. Hello, everyone. My name is Grace, and the topic of my speech today is embracing the uncertainties. Um. I will call myself a planner before. I like to plan everything ahead because I feel safe. Everything when everything is set in stone, and when I know everything in advance. However, what I ignored is that life is unpredictable, and sometimes there are things we cannot control. This is my fifth year studying in the U.S. I've encountered a lot of challenges throughout the way, but those challenges have never had such a huge impact on me compared to the coronavirus outbreak this year. As we all know, starting January, a huge coronavirus outbreak began. And has expanded to nearly every single corner of the globe. My hometown, Hubei, actually is the epicenter of the disease, and unfortunately, my mom and all my relatives are trapped in the city during the spring festival. Because of this, I have to pay close attention to the details and updates of the disease. In the beginning, I thought it was only a typical flu season. However, after so many cities were being sealed off, and even my mom told me that her friends had passed away because of the virus. I felt extremely shocked and scared by how fatal and powerful the virus could be. I knew that some of my family members are fighting the front line in Wuhan, the worst affected area, making sacrifices in exchange for a better future for the country. I felt extremely proud of them, but at the same time, I'm more concerned with their health. So I immediately contacted my friends to send face masks back to my family, as the only thing that I can do in the U.S. far away. My mom has also decided not to move back to China for my March break. Because she considered the U.S. was a safer place for me to stay, until the disease actually hit the U.S. during February. Before March break began, there were only a few cases in the whole United States. So my friend and I、um, decided to go to New York City for our March break, not knowing that New York will be a huge epicenter of the disease just a few days later. We were told by our parents not to go anywhere but just stay in the house, and they've ordered abundance of food and supplies to the apartment for us. We thought that staying in the house would be the worst case scenario, but that was not it. The numbers of people who got affected rose from several to nearly a hundred in just two days. One day morning, when my friend and I were enjoying breakfast, my mom called me and said, "Go pack right now. There will be a car coming, driving you to a hotel in Boston in the next two hours." And my friend's mom also called her, saying that she was leaving New York too to go to a family's friend's house down in Connecticut. We were overwhelmed. By this temporary decision, but under such a situation, we have no other better choices. The second day after we left, 
a state of emergency was declared in New York City, where hundreds of cases have been reported. So to speak, New York had become the second Wuhan. Just when I thought everything was settled, I would return to school just a week later. However, no one could control the course of the disease. That night, I received an email from school saying that one of the faculty on campus was tested positive for coronavirus, and the headmaster has decided to postpone the returning dates for all students, and he wanted all international students to go back to their family as soon as possible. However, I was faced with some difficulties. First, there were all no plane tickets left. Second, what if I got factors at the airport? As a junior in high school who is facing college application right now, not going back to school and having classes can really be an obstacle. What about my GPAs? What about all my AP tests? Should I even go back to China? But where else can I stay if I continue staying in the U.S.? Fortunately, my mom was able to connect with one of her friends in Boston to let me stay in her house the rest of the time. Even though it seems like 2020 has just started, there seems to be so many things that have happened and no one knows what's to happen next. A really famous quote in the movie Forrest Gump says that, life is like a box of chocolate. You never know what you're gonna get next. What I've learned from the experience is that even though we can't control the disease or predict the future, but we do can control the attitude and thoughts we choose to face the difficulties. What I've also learned from this experience is that adversity can make us grow and learn. Even though it might seem and feel like a determined enemy, but it really can turn into a valuable ally. It all depends on how you look at it. Years later, I will certainly remember the scene as I walked out from the hotel telling myself, change the changeable, accept the unchangeable, and remove yourself from the unchangeable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Payal. Okay, uh, so let's have the second speaker, Liu Sitong from Zhongguo Renmin Dashue Fushu Zhongxue. Liu Tongxue, can you please stand by? Let's give the Taipan a little time to finish their notes. And so for all the judges, please type a one again in the chat and let me know uh, you are ready to move on to the next speaker.
好的，可以开始了，刘思彤同学。Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My name is Si Tong Liu, and my number is two three two two three. My topic is stop spreading the media virus. When the coronavirus started to spread four months ago. What I was afraid of the most was not the disease. I was afraid of the chaos of information on the media. Every day when I check my social media, when hundreds of articles with true or false information mixed together, I could only be confused and even be frightened by this challenge of identifying the truth. I'm sure some of you may feel the same as I do. So today, I'm going to tell the phenomenon behind this challenge, how it can influence us, and what we can do to stop the spread of confusion on the media. In this new era of the internet, every piece of information can be spread so quickly. Every click and share on social media increases the number of people being affected exponentially. Of course, it does benefit us. And enables us to know events happening right now. However, the information on the internet contains not only the truth but also misleading news. Improper exaggerations and even fake data are now commonly applied by some news organizations to support their own thesis. Unethical organizations even developed conspiracy theories to exploit panic. Why? To gain their own interest in money and popularity. When I was awakened at midnight by the post, "Here comes the medicine that can save your life from the coronavirus," I have no idea whether I can believe it or not. Under this high pressure of keeping safe, the ability for us to identify fake news drops. Just as the New York Times published, the internet is losing our grip on the truth. It might seem not really consequential to have fake news around, but when we click likes, when we share it to our social media, and when we call on our friends to follow, it creates a snowball effect that infects more and more people, just like a virus. According to the Guardian, a man died because he ingested a product made to clean fish tanks to get a cure for the article. You may say this is not a common case. Well, when news articles instigate people to snatch a type of medicine crazily, when biased articles aim to bring regional discrimination in China and even in the whole world, unnecessary conflicts are created. Thanks to those fake news, since if it manufactures the story one step further. If medical supplies are employed incorrectly by millions of people, and if it creates the huge panic in eleven countries that urges people to rush around, the deadly virus will not be the coronavirus. It will be spread by the media. This is not merely a problem in China; the whole world is facing this issue. Noticing the consequence of misleading news on the internet, Chinese governments and the United Nations announced measures to reduce fake information. When Chinese organizations are trying to lead this change in the world, we can also contribute to stop the spread of false information. First, identify what is correct carefully. The most reliable way is to follow the、uh, to follow the official websites owned by Chinese governments. After that, we will want to spread some information. Always remember to have our own judgments. Chinese apps like WeChat and Weibo now offer some channels to report fake information. So when you are doubt about an article, reporting to the supervising platforms is also a good choice. The existence of false information on the internet has has long been a problem. In this special period, we should especially pay attention to the media and restrain the spread of false information. 
Only if we stop spreading the media virus can we better focus on restraining the coronavirus and return to our healthy and happy lives as before from China to the world. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Liu Sitong teacher, for bringing us the presentation. The third contestant, the University of Shandong University graduate, Wang Botao, please be ready to prepare. Thank you. Are all the judges ready? Okay, Wang Botao 同学，请开始你的演讲。Can everyone see me? Not yet. Oh. Okay. Yes. Good. <laughs> Sorry for waiting. <laughs> All right. So, um, Peter, can I use my timer on the computer? Uh, yes. All right. <laughs> COVID-19 is taking so much from us, but it also brings something special. It's an opportunity to come together as one humanity, to work together, to learn together, to grow together. This is what the World Health Organization's Director General, Dr. Tedro, said in his speech. January 7th, it seems to be just another common day. But the first suspended case of coronavirus was diagnosed. Then, just 20 days, the scope of the epidemic era has grown rapidly all over China. Chinese government then took steps in epidemic prevention and control effectively. They guaranteed adequate food supplies, they provided free medical trades, and sent quite a few medical teams to all parts of China to fight against coronavirus, although the circumstances are dangerous and severe. I have a friendly neighbor who is a director for the pulmonary department in her hospital. She volunteered to let her team to a county town in Shandong and hasn't been back for four weeks. 
My dad is a government official who still audits the financial revenue, although the condition is so perilous. As the saying goes, there's a time when we hear the certain calls, when the world must come together as one. Standing here, I'm too proud and willing to see so many selfless fighters confronting difficulties as teams. This spring festival, my family drove to the hometown and passed a few toll gates. But every time when we passed the toll gates, we had to take our temperatures by the infrared thermometer. Well, even when we arrived home, we had to take our temperatures again and register our names. Well, what's more? Every time when we are going to shopping, we have to stop at the enter to take our temperatures again. But unfortunately, the fatality rate for coronavirus is still staying really high, no matter how strict the checking system is. But thanks to my father's help, we finally perceived the problem for the coronavirus successfully. Here's a fact. We all know that the coronavirus has such a long incubation period, up to 40 days, which means you might already become infected, but the symptom won't appear on your body directly. And every time that we take our temperatures, all the data is separated, so we cannot assure the incubation period. Therefore, that's where my inspiration comes from. Why we cannot create a new type of infrared thermometer or a new system for the infrared thermometer which we can observe the incubation period and cut down further infections. At the beginning, I started my work by forming a mind map for all possible problems infrared thermometer may face that cannot be solved by the coronavirus. Although it took me a really long time for about four weeks, but finally, we perceived the problem for the coronavirus successfully. I would like to give you an example for this. For example, the coronavirus today is really dangerous, but the infrared thermometer today is not well connected. So the government cannot assure the recent trails and the close contactors the infected individual met. But if we can have a new type of infrared thermometer, which we can scan our both face identities and take our temperatures at the same time, it will be much easier for us to get the detailed information and make sure the incubation period and take self-quarantine in time. Finally, thanks to our effort, our patent is received by the government. In my opinion, fighting coronavirus is a war, a war without guns, without bombs, or even smoke, but a war with virus, with doubts, with fears, with rumors, or even with discriminations. All of us should be the fighters in this war, no matter who you are. Because not only the doctors, the nurses, the policemen, or the scientists who should fight, all of us should be the fighters in this war because we have the determination to win. Our country may get sick. Our people may get sick. But we, as a brave, cohesive nation, will never, ever get sick. Because we are the nation who keeps on fighting until we succeed. Standing here, I firmly believe China, with the world, will win the fight because we already pull together as one humanity together. To sum up, this is my speech. Thanks for listening. Hi, 
Okay, 刘心怡同学 please start your speech. Okay, so should I start now? Yes, please. Okay. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my honor to make a speech here, and my topic for today is online classes should be more widely accepted. There is an old story about Norway, where people wanted sardines, live ones, and as many as possible. Live sardines were big business for fishermen, but there is one key problem. Due to the long shipping process, the sardines would die and become still before they reach land. Only one boat always kept most of its fish alive, even after several days on sea. No one was able to know how they did this until the old captain died, and the secret of the boat was revealed to the public. In the tank, full of sardines, they found a huge catfish, which feeds many on fish. As a result, the sardines must keep swimming and alert in order to avoid this predator. And this increased level of activity helps keep the sardines active and fresh. This fable is turning into reality lately. As the sudden arrival of COVID-19 forced many students to stay active in a small environment. Online classes has been the catfish that chases us and keeps us active. And I believe that other countries can learn from China's successes and failures in bringing schools online. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, from January to February, the production index of information transmission, software, and information technology services has increased by 3.8 percent. Meanwhile, a survey published on People.com shows that the number of active users per day for online educational app rose from 87 million to 127 million. Still, not long after online classes were put into practice, a number of users left unwarranted negative feedback on the many frequently used apps, which led to extremely low ratings that got them kicked out of app stores. <sighs> Your frustration and discomfort towards this new form of learning can be understood, and these apps still have a lot of aspects to work on. But it is important to realize that this behavior has consequences beyond difficulty in teaching. If an app is forced to be taken off the market, think about the extra time the coders have to work, especially during this harsh time. It might firstly abbreviate the time with family and lead to more anxiety. Simply, many people have waken up to this and the commentary below started to change. Online classes are gradually accepted by more and more people in China. Well, so here are two lessons for other countries to learn from China's experience. First, make sure that all the people are ready to handle so many challenges present by online learning. Second, make sure the apps themselves are mature to handle so many new users. Online classes 
has also changed our way to think about traditional learning in productive ways. For instance, not everyone can adapt to classroom learning. Densely packed schools can be tortured to people with social anxiety. My friend named Jane, who was bright and loquacious online, told me that every second life classroom was suddenly cut him into pieces. The internet provides him with a hobby to stay away from all the noises in reality. And online classes can help him to achieve what he can get in a more normal environment. This is not just true for people with social anxiety, but for many others with different obstacles in school. By witnessing this innovation, which feeds a wide range of students, other, more stereotypically open countries like America, Britain, or Canada will be more likely to follow this step and make a change. While adopting online classes in China has had its high and low points, I think the rest of the world can learn from us and make improvements, not just during this COVID-19 response, but also in future education globally. Thank you. Thank you, Liu Xinyi, for bringing us this wonderful presentation. The next contestant, from the Chinese National University of Hong Kong, Xu Yixin, please prepare to make your preparations. 许一新同学可以开始喽。Um, hi, can you see me and hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. My topic today is: Are you spreading rumors? Several months ago. A kind of traditional Chinese medicine, Shuang Huang Lian, hit the headlines and was sold out on a single night simply because of an unnamed post claiming it to be useful to the recent COVID-19. It was not the first time for the whole society to realize that inappropriate information had started to cause great problems, and the COVID-19 outbreak. Unveiled and somehow enlarges these problems. We are coming into the age of internet. News from any corner of the world can be spread everywhere. In short, indeed, we get to know more about the world, but at the same time, 
we are authorized to judge the world. So rumors are formed, and we have been constantly arguing about who creates them. Yet people buying it are the ones to blame. These sounds counterintuitive. Aren't these people victims? Indeed, they may be largely affected by the rumors. Yet as they forwarded those materials, they are actually helping to spread, to spread inaccurate information. Yeah, for instance, Chinese elderly are keen on health caring products. My grandparents bought various kinds of them. And I also noticed that they shared articles about these products pretty often. In the end, my grandparents are actually fooled and ultimately became a rumor spreader. What's more, similar things are happening everywhere around China and, of course, around the world. So now, much people have been affected by the rumors. And we may think that these problems only happen on the ignorant people. Yet the boundary between vice and ignorance is vague. When individuals form a crowd, the rational ones seem to be fragile and are likely to be influenced. As a result, crowds are usually unreasonable. Just like what Gustav Le Bon said in his book, The Crowd. Well, people subservient in an irresponsible crowd, in which, in consequence, he is assured of impunity, gives him entire liberty to follow them. This actually helps to explain why people are getting out of control on demonstrations. And the Shuanghuang Lei events mentioned at the beginning is a perfect sample of irresponsible crowd. And these whole things made us think. Terrifying rumors and shocking news can actually happen on everyone. Which means preventing rumors from spreading is a particularly tough work and will become tougher in the future. But there are ways to reduce rumors. We need to rationally balance the reliability of the information. This can help filter a considerable amount of rumors. Additionally, appropriate researches can help us make wise decisions and minimize the damage. Even more, the governments had already taken action. The Chinese government, for example, they had set out policies to elevate the standard of comments and articles posted online. And scientists eventually offer free lecture to the public so that people can gain knowledge and rumors can be raised fundamentally. To put it in a nutshell, it's hard to completely eliminate rumors, but we should not be spreaders for rumors. In this special period, there's few for us to do to fight against virus, but as a Chinese citizen, we need to elevate our personal qualities and help prevent rumors from spreading. Thank you very much. Thank you, Xu Yixin, for the presentation. The sixth participant in the competition is the Wuhan Yingzhong University School, Pan Yiwen student. Please be prepared. 
潘一文同学，请开始你的演讲。Hello, everyone. Today, the topic of my speech is "What is your true color?" When things fall apart, people show their true colors. Growing up as a huge fan of disaster movies, I consider this quote from one of them my life motto. I remember watching a disaster movie when I was seven years old. I was so intrigued by the stories that I dreamed of it that night. In the dream. An invisible monster invaded my hometown. Many scenes were so vivid that I will never forget them. Supermarkets short of supplies, hospitals crowded with dying patients, and the world was torn apart by anger derived from fear. The seven-year-old me woke up, frightened. Ever since that day, I have been constantly haunted by the question: What is your true color? Whom will you be in a movie? The heroic protagonist. The ignorant supermarket staff, or the self-serving sergeant. This winter, I got my answer most unexpectedly. My nightmares ten years ago came true. In December 2019, COVID-19 or coronavirus hit my hometown Wuhan. As a girl born and raised here, I love this city and it is part of my identity. It breaks my heart to witness the people. My people encountering one of the most devastating disasters on Earth. Some of my friends and neighbors, people I greet on a daily basis, died from this invisible monster. So many times I prayed that this was just a nightmare that I would wake up from, and my parents would come and console me. This surreal feeling ended when someone reached out to me. Someone in my neighborhood contacted me and pleaded with me to feed her cats locked in her house. Judging from the sound of her voice, she was devastated. Her neighbors rejected her request, saying it was too much of a risk. Frankly, it was. At that time, the situation was dreadful, and her house was surrounded by confirmed cases of coronavirus. Just as I was pondering, another person with an identical dilemma reached out to me. I began to ask myself the question ten years ago: Who will I be in the crisis? The answer is. I want to be a hero in my little world, someone that puts love and conscience above everything else, like the numerous doctors and nurses, volunteers and social workers. Their stories motivated me, and I ended up lining with local volunteers, treating needy pets with precaution. This time, I have shown my true color. Although the changes I made were negligibly small, it changed me entirely. In a crisis like this. I believe everyone encounters the same question: What is your true color? I saw so many magnificent people answering this question with their own lives. In Wuhan, doctors like Li Wenliang, nurses like Liu Fan, volunteers like He Hui, along with thousands of people in the front line, devoted their lives to what they believed in. They did it for their hometown. They did it to protect their people. They did it because it was who they were. Their sacrifices are venerable and enlightening. Meanwhile, many people are showing the true color of mankind. Discrimination and racism against people in Hubei province are widespread and observed. So, one of my brothers was in another province when the disaster struck. To my surprise, he was attacked, even ostracized, for merely being someone from Wuhan. This discrimination is on a global level. Some of my friends who are living in other countries say people avoid them simply because they are Asian. This discrimination and hatred needs to stop, not only for the thousands of warriors sacrificed in this war, but also for showing the true color of mankind. We should prove to the earth that we are innately loving species that deserves to live on it. We should remember we are human for a reason. We should all be able to look back in ten years. And said that our actions matched up to how we perceive ourselves. Please, no matter nationality or birthplace, let's remember we are all in this together. The action we make today will affect many generations in the future. 
What's your true color? Let's all give a satisfying answer to the seven-year-old kids lying in bed thinking about whom they want to be in the future. Thank you. Okay. 好的,李华明同学,请开始你的演讲。Hello so everyone, may I get started? Cool. Sure. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's my great honor to stand here to give you my speech, Change the Game. I want you guys to imagine a day in which you can only spend $2 the daily supplies, including food and electricity. Do you think you can maintain this lifestyle for months? And do you really think that you can maintain this lifestyle for your entire life? But this is still a life in many countries. People still don't have enough food to eat and clean water to drink. What they have is disease and disaster. We all know the rich second generation who live a carefree life. Yet somehow, there are still people who remain starving every day. There are still people who suffer a great amount. There are always people who die accidentally. While well, the irresponsible people use the capitals to feed their own desires. The world is forever not fair. Now, seeing people suffer, we have two choices. One is to ignore it and continue with our own lives, where another is to fight for them. And China, as a responsible and influential power, chose the second one. The One Belt and One Road, the APEC, and even the elevation of poverty. For almost half a century, China has become the symbol of generosity and unity. As you guys all know, when coronavirus was rampaging in China, instead of standing still, the Chinese government, local authorities, and some social organizations all allocated money and labor building new hospitals. Although China is not as wealthy as America, Chinese people do have the most tenacious and inspiring quality to never give up. How many of you know how fast it is to build a hospital in China? The answer is 10 days. That is not because that they have the best machines around the world, but because all the workers volunteered to work longer and harder. It is because every one of us is trying to help each other rather than in trouble. From the world's perspective, China is the only country which has the ability to cope with this kind of virus with such an unbelievable efficiency. A century ago, China was weak. Our people couldn't even get enough food, making survival difficult. It seemed that everyone could laugh at China. Everyone could say that China is the worst. You know what? Even when I was in England two years ago, people from Russia and France still thought that China was a dirty and poor country. But now, China is the world's biggest exporter and the second biggest importer. We have the second largest GDP in the world as well. No countries can play on China anymore. China is rising 
Because we believe that when people are united together, amazing things can happen. Because thousands of Chinese people like me, who once looked down upon by foreigners, are struggling silently. For ourselves and for our country. For the next time foreigners say Chinese, they will say, China is the best. And today, in the face of coronavirus, I would like to stand here and say, the virus will be ended and everyone will be fine because it came to the wrong country. It comes to a country with history of 5,000 years, which teaches us to be soldiers of life. The world is a chessboard on which we play a game that was never supposed to be fair. I hate to say this, but we do inherit most of the social capitals. They get to decide what kind of role we start with when we come to this world. The world is not fair. But it doesn't make it any less worthy of living. Because we believe that the balance of the world will decline to us in the end. So go play with what you have carefully, but boldly at the same time to unleash the unknown possibilities of life or change the game. Thanks for listening. Hope Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Recently, China and even the whole world are facing a big challenge. You know, the coronavirus disease. And today, I'm going to talk about how internet assists us to overcome this difficulty and how Chinese teenagers behave during this this. Back in 2003 first, SARS was breaking out in Peking, and a fair number of people infected the visit. Then, Peking government immediately asked local schools to suspend classes, and companies must be shut down in order to control the serious epidemic. In that case, people felt bored at home, and students couldn't enter the campus. However, even though the internet didn't prosper in the past, Peking Education Commission made six high schools work together to apply online education. To their surprise, some functions such as recorded courses, online answering, and interactions motivated and benefited students to a tremendous extent. From this instant, 
we can discover the coverage of Chinese, which helped them unite together quickly to resolve any tricky problems. Now, let's turn our attention to 2020. Since the coronavirus started to rage, internet has played a crucial role in this war. And, and thanks to the flourish of internet recently, we will never need to doubt about the publicity of, of information or the education of students. What's more, considering the rapid response to the last epidemic SARS and coronavirus now, it's obvious that China has experience in abundance. Therefore, Chinese medical specialists enjoy to share information associated with virus by using video calls with foreign experts, only to its convenience and zero probability of infection. But things are not always perfect. One day, when I took my chemistry online class and after learning the new topic, that chemistry teacher wanted his students to answer some questions. And Paul was so lucky to be the first person who had been chosen. But unexpectedly, Paul didn't give us a perfect answer. Or even worse, we can hear some sounds about video games passed through his microphone completely. It dawned on us that Paul didn't concentrate on the class. This is a little thing, but it can respirate a negative phenomenon. And that's why I'd like to investigate students' attitudes toward online education and their opinions to the distractions which affect them in daily lives. Fortunately, Paul was just a rare example. As far as now, 123 students participated in my survey, and I found that around 80% of respondents said the effect of online education was brilliant or it was totally similar to the classes in school. My best news is that approximately 90% of respondents said they were able to put themselves in the class seriously and harvest a lot. That illustrates that Chinese teenagers are striving to study rather than wasting time online. What's more, it's known to us that opportunities are always staying with the challenges. And apparently, Chinese young generations succeeded in seizing the chance to improve themselves during this distance. In this world, all human beings should be unified into a united front in, without discrimination, so that we can become stronger enough to fight against our same enemy coronavirus. Also, in this world, Chinese young generations not only behave well at what they should do as students, we can also detect their social responsibilities. For example, some of them help local communities by taking residence temperature, and some set charity organizations in order to raise funds for every patient. Some look for medical resources all around the world, and some create their original music compositions, which encourage the whole brain nation. In this world, Chinese young generations are using their own behaviors and internet to gradually change the world. Well, the thing ends up changing the world is the cohesion of Chinese, which is the most powerful inspiration of humans. As it is a treasure which is depositing in Chinese history for 5,000 years, I believe that Chinese young generations will pass it and keep it alive forever. Thank you. Hada,谢谢于家豪同学带来的演讲。第九位也是倒数第二位决赛选手是来自南京外国语学校的金宇晨同学。请金同学提前做好准备。
好的，金宇辰同学，你可以开始你的演讲了。金宇辰同学，我这边显示你的网络可能不太稳定，嗯，你先试一下，如果有必要的话，你可以先退出 Zoom 教室，然后再进入试一下。Okay, um, then can you hear me smoothly now? Yes. Okay, then the topic for my speech today、uh, is. Sorry, but we cannot see you. Have you turned on your video? Yeah. Okay, we can、yeah. see you now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the topic of my speech today is discrimination and us. My time starts now. On a Sunday morning in late January 2020, the once busy street in my hometown Nanjing was empty. No cars, no pedestrians, and the stores were all closed. No, it's not doomsday, but a pandemic crisis we're going through. We, the ordinary people in this country, have voluntarily given up outdoor activities for two months in an effort to stop the spread of COVID-19. We took extreme measures, hoping to warn the rest of the world of this. I'm sorry. Then maybe I should log out and then go back again. I'm sorry. And I'll try to reconnect to the internet. Um, I think Yu Chengjing. She is logging out and trying to enter this room again. So please,、uh, stay patient and give her some time. Okay, she is in now. Um, I feel really sorry for the disconnection. And can you now see me and hear me? Yes. Okay. Then give me a second, and I may start. Okay. So the topic of my speech today is discrimination and us. My time starts now. On a Sunday morning in late January 2020, the once busy street in my hometown Nanjing was empty. No cars, no pedestrians, and the stores were all closed. No, it's not doomsday, but a pandemic crisis we're going through. We, the ordinary people in this country, have voluntarily given up outdoor activities for two months in an effort to stop the spread of COVID-19. We took extreme measures, hoping to warn the rest of the world of this grave situation. But things didn't work out as we had hoped. When the epidemic was mostly in China, they attacked. 
The Wall Street Journal referred to China as the real sick man of Asia, and the Herald Sun called this crisis a pandemonium. My friend who was studying abroad at that time said people would push her away when she was on a crowded subway and change tables to sit far apart when she ate in a restaurant, as if the virus was inscribed in her nationality. I got so furious. How absurd it was to associate contracting the virus with being Chinese. The anger propelled us to gather friends from all over the world to voice rationality. And we conveyed the same message. Virus has no boundaries. No matter where we are from, we're faced with the same danger of getting the virus. And this does not change even if our skin colors vary. While I was posting a video online, however, I saw another piece of news that really cooled me down. It read, migrant workers from Hubei seeking jobs in other cities were constantly denied access and turned away, even if most of them proved that they had tested all queer for the virus. It reminded me of another story. In the first days of Wuhan's lockdown, a family drifted on the highway with a Hubei license. They hadn't been in Hubei for the past few weeks, but they got rejected every day, every time they tried to settle down. They tried to book a hotel room, but the rooms were unavailable for them. They tried to sleep in a rest zone, but they were soon driven away. All because of where they were born. I suddenly thought, isn't it the same? When we blame the Western world for being so mean to China, have we also shut the doors to Hubei people? Before the global outbreak, China was the epicenter of the world, as was Hubei to China. We wish the world could recognize our efforts and be kind to us, but we ourselves are equating Hubei with coronavirus, labeling the people as virus carriers. We are excluding them only because they come from a special place, but forgetting how they're the ones who suffered the greatest loss in the battle. China is not synonymous with coronavirus. Neither is Hubei. How can we expect the world to respect us if we don't even treat our compatriots as equal? I know we must be very, very cautious at this time, but don't let our fear get over compassion. It is at dark times like this, should we stand together as one? Show the world how we truly empathize with other people. Show the world how we never define them by their city, province, country, or race, but see them as individuals we should respect. It fills my heart with warmth and joy to see that China has been collaborating with the rest of the world exporting necessary supplies and personnel to help resolve the crisis. I know we can get through it. As long as we say no to discrimination, as long as we fight against the virus as a whole. Thank you. So there was a small accident um, during Yu Chenjing's speech, but I believe she handled it uh, in a very calm and competent way. 最后一位的决赛选手是来自北京市十一学校的党天怡同学，请党同学提前做好准备。Okay. <笑> 然后也给裁判一点点时间，他们还在嗯完成上一位选手的notes。
OK， 党同学，你可以开始你的演讲了。All right. OK. So you can both hear me and see me. Yes. OK. So I'm going to start.、Mm -hmm. My topic is the pressing issues behind COVID-19. As Bill Gates said in 2015, the greatest threat that mankind might face in the future is not a nuclear war, but an outbreak of an epidemic. The success in the fight against COVID-19 in China might make us think that the battle against this pandemic will be over soon. But I'm here to tell you that this disaster is far from ending. Emerging to us are two ensuing calamities around this global health crisis: economic recession and racial discrimination. Especially against Asian descent, but even so, there are many more hidden issues lurking around this ongoing pandemic. One of the most prevalent issues is linked with children. It is estimated that, due to the closing down of schools worldwide, about 1.5 billion students are affected. Here in China, we have an integrated online teaching system, but we hardly notice that students in many other developing countries. Suffer from inaccessibility or the slow spread of e-learning resources due to poor internet connections. Moreover, with the loosening of connections between families and schools, combined with sheer isolation between kids and their friends and nature, children's mental states starts deteriorating. The United Nations has already expressed concerns on this front since domestic violence had been on the rise globally during the lockdowns. The second hidden issue is for students of Asian descent. Stereotypical views are irrational since every human is created equally. Some Asian students do not, for the least, appear to be inferior, but in reality, great imperatives concerning how they are treated are blatant. Though reported cases of discrimination are only the tip of an iceberg, Stop AAPI Hate, a program that tracks coronavirus-related racist acts. And the U.S. received almost 1,500 reports from Asian Americans across the country in the first four weeks since March 2020. The cases are associated with the purported cause of the virus, which racists believe to have come from China. This has sparked a flame of animosity towards Chinese among pre-existing xenophobes. As a result, the fear of discriminatory abuse and violence. Will be forever embedded in both the victims and the observers' mind. This trend will cause severe damages to Asians who are predisposed to being conservative, to feel more self-doubting, and to lose courage to fight against racism. The third shrouded issue is the imperity in which this virus hits. Racism is for sure one of the prompting devils, but that's not the whole picture. The situation is particularly problematic in developing countries, especially in the slums of South and Southeast Asia, Africa, and Latin America. There, many people lack adequate supplies of drinking water. They have to share a water tap or use shared toilets. This is such an alarming issue, since between 900 and a billion people are estimated to live in such informal settlements, often in high-density areas. This, combined with pre-existing coughs from charcoal, social distancing becomes virtually impossible, and conditions get easily exacerbated. Besides, the situation there would draw medical supplies away from other deadly diseases like malaria and Ebola, posing a nearly untreatable threat. Despite of these pressing issues, there is still hope for defeating this disaster. If we ponder upon the positive aspects that COVID-19 has brought to us, let's take the U.S. as an example. If it was just normal flu, would U.S. citizens pay a lot of attention to it? It is thus conducive for their minds, after witnessing the poor actions of their government, to opt for a change in their perspectives in judging and electing a new leader. With such great opportunity, we ought to spread the notion of thinking in the long term. Seeing through the masquerade and grasp their genuine disposition and interests, and to act wiser when opting for leaders who would impact countless people's well-being by engaging their practical and non-biased contributions to the society. Having irresponsible leaders will affect people's desire to closely cooperate with international organizations in relieving global problems like climate change, 
inequality, and will soon forget this harsh pandemic and not working on the prevention of it. At this stage, there's no doubt that it's beneficial to the world if we contribute our peripheral endeavors. But the central effort is to be made by leaders in which some of them are ill-equipped. They are the fundamental issues worth more of our attention and tackling. We envision more of the kind of the leadership displayed in China. We believe in cooperation, coexistence, and mutual respect. And the days of suffering, as well as the darkness in the society, would just be an ordeal that tests our unity as the same species and would offer us an incentive for transformation in the society towards the better. Thanks. Hadakang speech just wraps up all the um the final of the high school division of the China to the World Speech Contest. Now let's welcome every judge to provide some feedback and share their insights with us. The first judge who is going to give some comments is the global director from NSDA US, Mr. Stephen Bouchard. Stephen, are you ready to share your insights with us? Uh, yes, can you hear me? No, oh, you can't. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. All right, well, uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to participate. Um, this is a judge. I've really enjoyed hearing uh, all the speeches, and I, I listened to the, uh, the middle school students speak as well. And uh, before I make uh, comments on uh, the two students, uh, you know, I've been asked to talk about, I just want to make two general comments. The one is that you know, I was really impressed listening to everybody talk about how people in China are really unified um, to, to fight the virus. And you have a real kind of a, a common, you know, goal, everyone working together, everyone recognizes uh, it's a threat. You don't see that every everywhere in my country. People are arguing about like whether or not the virus is real and like whether or not we should try to fight it. So it's really nice to see that everyone is unified in this direction. And second, it was just really interesting to hear, you know, all the different ways people talk about how the virus has kind of impacted them and their lives. And, you know, the general topic is China and discrimination, right? But it's very much people talked about, like, you know, how, they, they, how it's being used on the internet and the online classes and different parts of the way that it works in the world and how it's being portrayed in the media and what different people can do. So, I thought it was also just like a great collection of um, speeches about the, you know, the different ways that virus is impacting us and how people are reacting. So I was like really excited uh, you know, to have the opportunity to hear these speeches. Um, as for some comments, um, you know, first on Sitong um, that uh, asked me to comment, I thought it was a, uh, oh, wait, yeah, I'm sorry, um, uh, Peyu. I, I like kind of, the, I think it was a good speech uh, in a way to kind of kick everything off because it really kind of talked about like, you know, first obviously the origin of the, the virus in Wuhan and, you know, how that impacted your family and then bringing it to New York. I was kind of running out of New York around the same time there in the middle of March, just as everything hit. Um, so I could really kind of sense that. I thought you did a really go good job of portraying what that was actually like as people were fleeing and people became concerned and then they, you know, they went inside and they didn't know what to do. So I thought that was very, um, very well done. Uh, I would encourage you to, and you also were very articulate and you, you spoke very well. Um, it didn't appear you were standing up or uh, I think you should kind of stand up, kind of deliver the speech, use kind of some hand gestures and then maybe try to tie it back. Like, I think you had a lot of potential to tie it more into like, you know, how New York was like New Wuhan, right? You were in New York, you had family, from what I could tell from the speech, you had like kind of extended family in Wuhan. These are both kind of big cities. 
They're actually have very similar populations. Uh, Wuhan's population is around 11 million people, and New York is 9 million, plus the immediate area around it is another 2 million people. So they have almost identical populations. So I think one thing you could have done with the speech is like pull those um, connections a little bit uh, together. Um, in terms of Sitsong, I think the media um, is really important. And it was interesting, too, to hear how people kind of struggle with the media in, in China and not just inside uh, the United States. So I thought you did. I thought I thought the topic was interesting. Um, I think to maybe give some more examples might have been good. I like a couple that you gave, but just really maybe from different parts um, around the world, how it's very similar to what's happening there. Um, but you did a great job with the hand gestures and the projecting your voice and uh, and standing up. So those are hey. my uh, comments. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, the next judge who is going to be on stage is on David Liu, the operation director from We School. Hi, David. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Give me a second. I'll just put all the information. Um, I think for Wang Botao, um, speaking of his, uh, you know, speaking skills and technical skills, I think Warbley gave very clear articulation of his speech, and uh, you know, he used the good uh, gestures, uh, which you know, supporting his uh, speaking content. And that's uh, you know really good, and also you know he I really like his uh, the structure of uh, you know his speech is uh, you know quite clear and easy to follow, and I can see you know the logic of uh, you know his thinking and how you know he used um, materials and supporting evidence you know to support his uh, thesis, and also uh, well, another good point is that uh, he. He really made a you know clear thesis, and um, at the beginning he he used uh, the uh, a citation from a WHO official, and that's quite uh, you know impressive. Uh, he changed a little bit you know from the the semifinals, uh, but I think it's uh, it's a good change, and it definitely you know it's um, it's it's a plus. Um, also, I think he and during during his speech, he used many you know personal stories, uh, which is you know credible and uh, convincing. And I can see you know how you know how he used his uh, personal experience and his innovative ideas and trying to you know help others you know try to deal with the crisis and try to you know figure out you now how you know his family innovations. You know, could uh, contribute, you know, to the crisis. But there's one, I guess, there's one improvement he might, you know, think, you know, a little about is that, you know, he he talked about the innovative ideas and efforts in fighting against the virus, but, you know, he he, he didn't really, you know, try to expand that. In a greater perspective, I'll just uh, you know, give uh, give you an example. Um, you talk about you know your your family or yourself, innovative ideas and thoughts, and how these ideas accepted by the government, and how that you know help you know the government to, to take further actions you know to handle the this. But maybe you know talk a little bit more about you know the technology innovation. Or society innovation and how these innovations can contribute to not just dealing with the crisis, but also you know contributing to the economic growth, or you know contributing to you know China and maybe some other countries. So if you can you know expand your speech to that, uh, might be you know lifting your speech to another level. So that's. Maybe you know one little improvement you might think for the for the future. So overall, I think he he gave really you know brilliant uh, a speech and uh, really great you know job you know done. 
Uh, I guess that's uh, that's my comments for for Boto, and also for for Xinyi. Um, again, you know, speaking of his skills and the technical part, uh, she is also very clear, you know, verbally, and she has really you know great control of speaking space, and she you know pacing her speech. Uh, in a very conf confident and a very you know smooth ways, and uh, she is able to use you know hands you know gestures to support her her speech to support his, you know, her speaking content. Also, eye contact is good, and body language is also help. Uh, I can see that she she really give uh, a full of emotions, uh, especially you know in the beginning. You know, she she cited the, the example of uh, catfish effect. That's really you know interesting you know start, and it can effectively attract uh, audience attentions. Especially my attentions is quite uh, you know triggered my interest you know, to listen to more of her speech further. Um, although you know her her uh, statement is clear, but. Uh, after she gave this uh, this uh, you know personal this story of catfish effect, but I don't feel that she gave uh, a strong um, argument, a strong supporting you know evidence to you know let us understand why online learning should be more accepted. Um, for the for the current situation, because of the the, the crisis, because of the you know, coronavirus, students have to do online because they don't have other choices. But what would happen if the crisis is over? So if she can you know, touch a bit of it, you know, on that might be you know giving a more convincing and a more broader perspective of her speech and it can lift you know, her speech. Uh, to another level, so that's that's one of the suggestions I would give to to Xin Yi. Um, some other brilliant points, she she used very good you know, personal examples. Uh, very, I feel connected with her you know personal experience, and um, another one. Mm, suggesting is about uh, again it's about the arguments um, when she make this argument that online should be more accepted you really need more supporting facts and explanations uh, for examples another example uh, she gave a claim that uh, foreign country should learn from us but at the beginning she didn't you know expand that claim uh, with more details and but, but later on he she you know repeated that again but she only talked about you know two lessons that other countries you know should learn from our experience uh, still uh, she didn't give more supporting you know, materials on that um, so give, give me a, a feel like uh, you know she concluded this speech you know a bit dry and um, uh, not well, you know, funded uh, way. So that's uh, another su suggestion. You know, she might be, you know, working on to improve it. So overall, I'm, I mean, she she's also done a great, uh, brilliant, you know, job. Uh, I hope my comments can be a can be a you know help for her to you know to improve in the future. Thanks. Thank you to you, Joyce. Thank you. Thank you for your advice, David. Uh, now let's welcome uh, the academic director from the SDA China, Mr. Kel Halley, to offer some of his thoughts. Kel, can you hear us? Yes. Uh, can you hear me, Joyce? Yes. Okay. Great. Well, um, first of all, I want to make a comment that you know applies to the speakers I was asked to talk about, uh, Xu Yixing and uh, Pan Yiwen. Uh, if my pronunciation is bad. Um, I want to make a comment that applies to you, but also applies to all of the competitors today. And that is that 
you know, all of you for making it to this stage have polished delivery. You all are great speakers, no doubt. Um, so really where I think the separation occurs between how we rank the best for this finals round comes down to content, the creativity of the content, the use of evidence, the ability to show your personality and be relatable with that content. Um, and that's probably the thing that's going to separate the first and second in this and from the rest. And even though lots of you have lots of very good content, there's definitely room for improvement for everyone. But I've been very impressed by all the speakers today, um, specifically with uh, Xu Yixing. Um, on your delivery, your delivery overall is very clear, but you do feel a little stiff. Um, I need to feel a little bit more relaxed. This goes with your technical skills as well, your body language. Um, it's a little repetitive and robotic. You're making the same sort of hand gesture over and over again. So watch that. It's important and it will add to your relatability if you look and feel more personable to us, feel more relaxed. Um, but, you know, you're understandable. This is certainly nitpicking comments. All of the comments I'm going to make are trying to find little ways to improve you. Overall, it was a, it was good delivery. Um, I think the importance of your speech is good. I like your example of the crowds. I think that was an original use of that. But I still think there could have been more evidence use in there, more ability to make it original. Uh, but the crowd point and that author that you cited uh, with his book about the crowds, that's good. I, wanna, I want you to just expand on that, continue doing that. I want to see more of that in your future speeches. And the grandparents, your grandparents, bringing them in um, definitely is a great way to make it relatable, to make us um relate to the points that you're making, because obviously all of us have grandparents and we can probably relate to that. But in order to make that relatability even wider, I wanna echo something that the previous judge talked about, and that is make the speech more broad in its appeal in who you're speaking to. For example, at the end, you of your speech you say what we should do as chinese citizens but the majority of your judges are not chinese citizens and um beyond just that you know the title of this competition is china to the world not china to china right and this is specifically with yu shi uh yi xing but th this occurs in other speeches as well so the other speakers who are listening try to remember Part of making a speech memorable is make sure that anyone can relate to it. And so it's fine to talk about specific people and individuals. You have to at some point, but be asking yourself while, you, while you're writing your speech that will everyone relate to this? Will everyone feel like they're being spoken to? One thing that separates, you know, a good speaker from a one in a million speaker, a great speaker is you know, good speakers can deliver a powerful speech, but great speakers, those one in a million speakers, can make everyone in the room feel like they're the only ones that you're talking to. And that level of relatability, that's the top tier. That's what you should be trying to strive for, not only in your content, but also in the way you deliver. Uh, on the subject of Yi Wen, um, Again, another strong speech. Uh, your delivery was loud and clear. You have a, uh, in, it, there is a little bit of an accent, but that's not a bad thing necessarily. Don't get me wrong. And it wasn't distracting at all. Overall, it was very loud and clear delivery. But I would like it to vary a little bit. You're, you have good passion, but your tone doesn't really vary much in that delivery. It's always strong and passionate. And sometimes you need to bring it down a little bit so that when you're strong and passionate, it actually sticks with us. If you're going at level 10 the whole time, then we don't really get the same 
emotional impact from what you're saying. You have to bring it down sometimes as well. But your facial expressions are very good. Um, that's one thing I think in everyone's delivery. Um, there were a few speakers in this finals that really separated themselves in being able to see the emotion on their face whenever they spoke. And uh, you were one of those that definitely you had a good job of wearing your feelings and your emotions with the way you smile, with the way you frown, with the way you deliver those speeches, um, those points. Um, and as far as the importance, the rebel relatability, and the originality of your speech. I love your disaster movie introduction. I think it's very relatable, very personable. It's original. And, and your organization was good the way you came back to that at the end. Solid. I don't, I'm not sure anyone did as good of a job as you of kind of connecting the beginning and the end of your speech. However, the weaknesses are there really is not any use of evidence um, in throughout the speech. There needs to be more of that. And if you're going to use evidence, definitely cite that evidence to make it stick out in our minds a little bit more. Um, you have a you obviously have great creativity in your writing and your delivery. Now we just need to make it more dynamic and more diverse. Need to have more evidence, more serious points. Um, vary up and make your delivery more dynamic and that's what will help you reach the next level whatever that level is for you but both yi win and uh yi xing uh great job you should be very proud of yourself for making it to finals this was not easy i believe there were over 1500 students entered or something like that so regardless of where you end up in the rank you should be very proud of how you did today Back to you, Joyce. Okay. Thank you very much, Cal, for sharing your ideas with us. Uh, next, let's welcome Professor Chu from Nanjing University. Chu uh, Okay. Hey. Uh, first, I'd like to say that uh, uh, Li Huaming and uh, Yu Jiahao, you have done very good work. I'm impressed by your talk. And uh, uh, regarding Yu Jiahao's uh, speech, uh, I'd say uh, I'd like to say that I think the speech is quite uh, well organized, and uh, uh, you have you have a persuasive way to uh, draw the audience. And I'm impressed by your uh, poor classmates' uh, pause, funny story, because uh, that reminds me of my high school years. And I'm also teaching online now, and I know that this kind of funny things happen a lot. And. Uh, uh, and uh, I noticed that when you talk about uh, your uh, classmates, funny story, uh, your, lang your body language and your language are very natural. And that's good. Uh, yet, uh, I have to say that uh, uh, sometimes I notice that you are a bit nervous. When you're nervous and uh, you can, uh, <coughs> so you cannot use, uh, you couldn't use the uh, proper gesture sometimes when you are you were nervous uh, uh, and, uh, but also i noticed that you use a lot of stress to emphasize on the importance of information that's good that's really good and uh, uh but i think that in addition to the poor story uh, you need to give uh, some other more uh, convincing uh, examples or evidences to support your argument. Uh, that is my personal opinion. Uh, regarding uh, Li Huaming's uh, speech, uh, I think that uh, uh, you have given us a very impressive speech. Uh, your articulation is very clear, and uh, uh, I think that you are very calm, and your body language in indicates your confidence. And. Uh, uh, the, the, the examples you have chosen uh, are related to the current situation. That's good. However, I'd like to say that uh, uh, the examples themselves are good. It, it means that you know a lot of things and you have a lot of knowledge. But uh, sometimes I notice the examples, some examples are overused. And uh, some examples are not that kind of powerfully interconnected to convince your audience. 
And uh, because I have a, a kind of, I'm from a kind of statistic background, you know, statistics, we talk a lot about evidence-based research. And uh, I think that you should prov provide more evidence that can attract your audience and that can be more persuasive. And uh, uh, you should, uh, you may need to convince your audience uh, using proper uh, reason and emotional appeal. That is my personal opinion. Overall, I think that your speech is very good. Sometimes I give students some negative feedback in order to help them to improve. But I, I think that you have done very good work. Uh, that is my uh, opinion. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Zhu. And the last judge who is going to share her thoughts with us is Mrs. Susan Ken, a very influential and powerful speaker. Hi, Susan. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, so first of all, it's been a real honor and a pleasure to listen to all of these talks and all of you who have gotten to this stage, you can really see how it is that you came to be here. So thank you for sharing yourselves with all of us tonight. Um, or tonight for me, probably today for, for many of you who are listening. Um, so I wanted to talk first about Yu Cheng. Um, you should know you have a very beautiful speaking voice and that is a huge asset for you. It's very easy to understand you and your voice has a real melodious quality that that, that is just going to be a real asset um, anytime you're out there trying to persuade people. And you're also very, very good at conveying the emotions that you're feeling. I would say that the two emotions that were most at the surface in this particular talk were the emotions of anger and compassion. And both of those came through loud and clear so that we really felt like we knew who you are and we felt like we knew what you were feeling and what you were trying to make us feel and it, it came through to us. Um, you had great posture, great use of gestures, as did many of, uh, of all of you who were speaking here tonight. Um, and you also, by the way, stayed very calm under the technical difficulties that you had. I, I imagine you had to have been feeling a little bit rattled inside, but you really didn't let that show and you didn't let it stand in your way. Uh, I found myself I found myself um, continually writing down quotations of the things that you had said because you had a very good way of, of um, encapsulating your ideas into catchy ways of saying things. So for example, you said, China is not synonymous with coronavirus, neither is Hubei. It was very simple and very declarative and it really stuck with me. Um, you said, don't let our fear get our compassion. So those kinds of statements were really very punchy, very powerful, very effective. Um, you had a great beginning, a great opening where you, you almost painted a visual image of your empty town. Uh, I felt like I was right there with you. And, um, and, and I felt that again when you painted that picture a little later on in the talk, uh, the picture of the family drifting along the highway. Uh, I, I think that's probably an image that's going to stay with me for a very long time. Um, and then finally, I'll say you did a great job linking the discrimination against China with the discrimination against Hubei as a, 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 in, in particular. Um, so I guess I'm not giving you that much uh, critical or constructive feedback here because so much of what I saw really was um, very positive and I thought you did a great job. Okay. Um, next, I'm going to talk about uh, Tin Yi Dang. I hope I'm pronouncing your name uh, somewhat correctly uh, and your talk on the pressing issues behind COVID-19. Okay, so um, great job. You also, was, you, you had a really wonderful energy. Uh, you come across as a very likable person, which is a kind of underrated quality in a speaker. If, if you're somebody who audiences immediately feel is trustworthy and they like you, uh, they're so much more willing to listen to what you have to say and they're more likely to be persuaded by what you have to say. Your eye contact was a little bit off. 
I'm guessing that's because you're not as comfortable speaking to a screen. Um, and maybe if you had been delivering the same talk to a live audience, we wouldn't have had that issue. But I do want you to know um, when you're talking to a screen, it looks as if you're kind of looking off to the side and the audience is over there and you're over here. Okay. Uh, you had a few too many gestures. It, it felt as if you didn't, you didn't come across as overly nervous, but it seemed as if you might be using or, or trying to display some of your nervous energy into your gestures. So just be aware of that. Um, in terms of your topics, your, your topics were really important, but it felt as if there were so many of them that it was hard for us as the audience to know where you wanted us to focus. Were we here? Were we here? Were we here? Um, so I would encourage you next time to pick more of a single idea um, and really develop your talk around that. And it doesn't mean that you have to keep that same idea and and only only stay there, but but pick the core idea and then develop out from there as opposed to first this idea, then this one, then this one, then this one. Um, that starts to lose us after a while as the audience, we're not quite sure where we are. Um, you did give a sense of truly caring about issues like discrimination um, and other people not getting access to education. Um, and, and that comes back to that quality that I was talking about at the beginning of you coming across as a truly likable and trustworthy person. And, and that came through as you were talking about these issues, um, what would have helped you would um, would have been to tell us stories that would illustrate the situation of people who were uh, faced with the difficulties that you want us to get uh, to, to be taking action around. Um, if you can make those stories relatable, you know, tell them through the eyes of real people, that's going to take us that much farther. Um, um, now, stepping back at the end of my remarks to talk about what you said at the beginning, I thought you had a great beginning where you talked about, um, you, you said something like, this calamity is far from ending. And the way you said that really made me kind of sit up and it got my attention. Uh, and yeah, I'll just I'm gonna end with this kind of elaborating on uh, a, a critique that I gave you just a moment ago, which is more original stories to illustrate your points and that I think you have a tendency to use statistics and arguments when you want to be persuasive. And those are great. I'm not at all saying not to use those, but just to, to build on them by giving us the human element and the storytelling element. And that's going to make us really connect with you and, and connect with what you want to tell us. Um, but you did a great job and so did all of you. And again, it's been an honor to be here with you all. Thank you very much, Sudan, for sharing your ideas with us. Uh, I think that wraps up uh, the final of the high school division. And uh, I believe all of your comments will be uh, valuable assets for all the contestants and all the audience who are watching this uh, final right now.